I cannot require specific actions. I can't make you come to a company meeting. Hey, we're going to have a meeting tomorrow at 9. Now, with that being said, here's what I'm going to tell you. There is an old adage that says, if you want to float big ships, you have to go to where the water is deep. Got it? <laughs> That's my Mr. Miyagi uh, advice for the day. What that means is, while I cannot force you as the employing broker to come to a meeting where I'm going to explain a new training technique or a new rule, if you are smart and want to succeed, you will in fact come to that meeting and learn so that you can better yourself and make more money, all right? The IRS actually has three requirements that you must meet as an independent contractor real estate to be considered what is called a qualified real estate agent. That is actually spelled out in IRS code that says if you want to deduct income or claim then to be a qualified real estate agent, here are three things that are required of you. First, you must have a current real estate license. Well, that's a no brainer. To be in the real estate world, you've got to be licensed. You must have a written contract with your broker stating that you will not be treated as an employee. When you go to work for any company, you will sign an independent contractor. Our independent contractor says basically this. You abide by all the rules. I abide by all the rules and I'll pay you what you earn. And, and, and I will also not pay any of your taxes, any of your car insurance, any health insurance. So our contract that you will sign with the modeling group specifically spells out that you are not being treated as an employee. All right. Every brokerage will do this. And why? Because of these rules. You have to have a signed contract. And the third thing here is a confusing. A substantial portion of your income as a licensee must be based on the sales production and not the number of hours worked. All right. Clear as mud. So let me explain this. What they are saying is this. Because you are a 1099, you get paid based on the outcome of a deal. But let's say that I call you up one day and said, hey, man, I need some database work. And I want you to, I'm looking for someone to help me transfer this database into another database. Would you be interested if I paid you? And you said, well, sure. And I said, okay, I'll pay you $20 an hour. And it's only going to take you about 10, 10 hours. So I pay you $200. Plus, at the end of the year, you have, say, let's close, say, you have earned 125000 in real estate commission. This hourly rate is so small compared to what you earned as a salesperson, you can still be treated as an independent contractor, even though during this time frame, I may have treated you like an employee. Hey, for those 10 hours, I need you to come in at nine o'clock because I won't be in there and work till five and you should be done in a day or two. A substantial portion of your income came from sales. Therefore, that allows me to treat this still as an independent contractor. Okay. So now you guys know that I'm famous for this. Let's change the story. Same scenario. I'm going to pay you $20 an hour. 
for uh, it's going to take you 10 hours. But you don't close anything from me. You don't get any sales this year. You actually sold a big fat zero. Now at the end of the year, look at the difference. As the employing broker, I actually paid you all of your money based on a system work and no money as a 1099. This is an example of I'd have to go back and reclassify you as an employee because the only income you earned was from a system-based work. I told you, be here at 9, work till 5. It'll take you a couple days and we'll be done. Thinking that you would probably sell, but you didn't. So these are two different scenarios where this $200 is a huge portion of the combined money you made because you made no sales. This example, it is such a small portion that they are going to go, okay, still treat those like an independent contractor. Another question I get asked a lot is, can I have multiple 1099s? Yes. Not from real estate. Um, let me restate that. Not at the same time. So you could work for me for, say, six months, leave the modeling group, go over to a Keller Williams franchise, and work for them for six months, you would get two of those at the end of the year. One for the amount of money I gave you and one for the amount of money that Keller Williams gave you. You could also have a W-2 and a 1099. Let's say you have a day job and you work real estate part-time. You would get a W-2 from your day job. Hey, I work for the fire department and they pay me 80 grand and I had to be there two days off, two days off, and all that. So they defined the system. So you're an employee and got a W-2, but you sold four or five houses throughout the year. And that now your employing broker sends you a 1099. So yes, you can have multiples of those. So those three things are required if you want to claim real estate. Got to have a license. You got to be employed by an employing broker and a substantial portion of your activities must be from sales. All right. A common question that gets asked is about a real estate assistant. Yes, you could have an assistant that works for you. That assistant can be licensed or they can be unlicensed. Now we're going to get into it a little bit when we go over the license law for your state that you're sitting in currently. Virtually every state allows an unlicensed assistant, but basically an unlicensed assistant cannot do any of the activities that a licensed person can do. Think back. A couple minutes ago, we talked about buy, sell, trade, lease, exchange, manage, list, rent, consult, refer. Those all require a license. If you have an assistant that is unlicensed, they can't do those things. All right. They could take pictures. They could coordinate the closing. They could coordinate other activities like the home inspection or the lending portion. They could do those things. They could answer the phone. Um, all of those things. If you had a licensed assistant, then yes, you might be able to send them out where you say, hey, you go sit in this open house today and in our other listing, I'll go sit in that open house. So the assistant can be licensed or unlicensed either way. So let's get to the point that everybody wants to talk about. How do I get paid? All right. How do I get paid? So as the employing broker, I get to charge for my services of listing the house for sale or helping the buyer find a house. That charge that I would give or charge is called a commission. That is my compensation 
for doing my activities that I have been trained so well to do. That commission is, is negotiated between me and my client. And it can be different on every client. I could say, well, I like you, so I'm going to do it for 4%. I don't like you, so I'm going to charge you 7%. Oh, it's your mother we want to help? We can reduce the commission to 1%. I, as the employing broker, have control because, like I said, for lack of a better word, I'm the boss. All right? So my commission can be paid in one of several ways. The most common one that you guys think see is a percentage of the final sales price. Like I just mentioned, I'm going to charge you 3% or 5%. I could also charge a flat fee. I could tell my client, hey, I'll do the whole thing for $1,000. I could also say, I'm going to bill you an hourly rate like an attorney does. When we're done, I'm going to keep notes and add up that I uh, worked for you for eight hours and I'm going to ch <clears throat> charge you $300 an hour. I will send a bill to closing for $2,400. So these are the ways that I, as the employing broker, <clears throat> can charge for my services. And like I just said, I can mix and match however I see fit as the employing broker. I could charge one person a percentage. I could charge another person a flat fee. I could charge a third person a percentage that's different than the first person because I have the control, the power, and the decision to do that. I get paid at what we call the closing or the actual conveyance. Now, here's a concept that I want you to make sure you get. People all the time talk about this. I get paid the day it closes. But I'm here to tell you, I earn my commission way back here. Remember day one when I asked you if I could get paid if a deal didn't close? And I told you the second boop, that they form a, a, a purchase agreement, I've earned my money because I did what I was supposed to do. Remember, brokerage bring together buyers and sellers. And I told you that if I brought them together and that for some reason one decides he doesn't want to complete the deal, I could still get paid because I earn my money here. When the buyer puts a purchase agreement in and the seller accepts the purchase agreement and that contract becomes formed is the word, that minute I have earned my money. Now, I may not collect that money for 30 days later when it closes and you will see closing, uh, we call this settlement. We call it a settlement date. And that name comes from because that's when we all settle up. You know, we bring the money to the table. We transfer the deed like we talked about. We all settle up. One of the settlement charges is my commission. So I may not collect it to the day of closing, but it's very important that you understand I've earned it. I'm entitled to it. I deserve it way back here when we when the buyer and seller agreed to do this all right so they're payable the day of closing now i earn that as long as three things happen and here are those three things i was licensed when the buyer and seller agreed to form that purchase agreement. I was employed under a contract by the principal, meaning the employing broker. Remember, those are two of the requirements. And here is the thing that you will argue most of your life. 
Were you the procuring cause? Procuring cause means, were you the reason this deal actually was formed? Was it your fault? And in this case, fault is a good thing. Are you the one that started the series or chain of events that ultimately resulted in the sale of the property? Now, typically in a live class, here is where we spend probably 20 minutes because everybody, oh, ask questions, oh, ask questions. So I understand that you are probably going to have some questions. I want you to feel free to email me, Raymond at realuniversity.com with any kind of scenario that you might be thinking about, but I'm going to try and cover some of them. If I don't cover the scenario that you ask about, I want you to reach out to me. There's all kinds of questions where students ask, what do you mean? So let me try and further delve into this. If I am the one working with the buyer and I took the buyer to the house to see it and that buyer ultimately buys the house, I would be the procuring cause for that buyer. If I am the one listing the house and that house ultimately sells, I am the procuring cause for the seller. Can a buyer lie? Yes, this is a common question that gets asked. So let me un try and cover it now. Suppose you're working with a buyer and the buyer calls you one Sunday afternoon and says, hey, Raymond, I want to go see a house. And I say, you know, I'm going to watch football today. Can we go tomorrow? And they go, sure, no big problem. So you hang up and they immediately call another broker because they don't understand. And all they really want to do is see this house that they love. And their wife told them to get a viewing. So they call another friend and says, hey, man, um, can you show me this house? And that other broker, being the excellent broker that he is, says, are you working with another real estate agent? And that person lies and says, no, I'm currently not. So he goes and shows the house to that buyer. And that buyer ultimately writes an offer, gets accepted and closes. That other agent would be the procuring cause because I am not the one that showed him the house. I am not the one that started this series of events that ultimately led to the sale of that property. You must be the procuring broker. Now, there are some ways to help protect you, and we'll get into them in another chapter, but I want you to see how that would work, all right?